you can continue, um, all the sessions were recorded, right? So you can continue watching the sessions and you can continue getting PDC points for that. Um, you can even sign up for college credit until April 15th, I think, or something like that. Um, so mm. just kind of make yourself a little list. Those classes will be available till, or sorry, workshops, whatever. The conference will be available for you to watch until August. So you've got this summer to get in, dig in there. There's hey. a lot of good stuff. Any comments from those of you that attended, quote unquote? I just started watching the one on utilizing different distance learning stuff. And there's a couple in there that I had never heard of so far. So I'm looking forward to learning more about that. Good, good. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, Dennis at Wyandotte High School uh, is really helpful in terms of if you're curious about some shop stuff. In fact, uh, I went over there yesterday and looked at their their CNC and their laser and he also hooked me up with Liberty where he used to be at so I could look at their stuff too. So he's got a ton of great projects and they're creating a big database online. So if you care about that stuff at all, shoot him a note and uh, he'll add you to a big Google Drive with a bunch of folders of projects and stuff. Was that a result of the conference that you hooked up with him? Yeah, he did two sessions on the CTE conference. I, I watched the first one and we're looking at some stuff. So I, I reached out to him. I haven't had a chance to watch his uh, follow-up session yet but um because there's just you know how many hours are there in the month but yeah what was his name matt somebody uh gonna... dennis blocklinger uh, i'll i'll look it up and put it in the chat here in a second i got it in my okay mind. thanks oh uh, i gotta tell you as a gal who spent a lot of time putting that conference together i might spill a little carry on <laughs> so thank you for saying that that's awesome that's exactly what we want as a result of this so that's great all right, any other thoughts on the CTE conference? Right. The, the uh, Fredonia coffee shop is a really interesting one to watch too. Um, that's a really involved project, but uh, even, even if you weren't to do the whole thing that they did, we've got a coffee cart in the school that they've been doing with special needs kids. And um, uh, so you can get a lot of ton of good. And I know there's a second one I haven't watched yet, um, but that was a good one. Yeah, good. There were quite a few school-based businesses, which was nice to get some different perspective on how to, and people just so willing to say, here you go, here's our stuff. <laughs> and if you didn't tune in, um, Dr. Solberg, he talked on February 15th about um, IPS, but just also about where are we going with kids in the world and what do they need and stuff. So um, it was excellent. I just thought it was so great. And this national speaker saying, hey, Kansas, nice work, you know, <laughs> on this and this, but then also some places where we need to dig in a little further. So that was great. He was awesome. Cool. Can I ask you a quick money, a uh, quick question about the grant money? Do you have those answers or is that Mark? I don't probably, okay. but if I pulled, actually, I pulled up the grant to read through that and, and I was going to make sure to mention some things, um, but I don't we just really... have. Go ahead. We have FCCLA National Leadership Conference coming up and it has tons of, of advisor continuing ed. Is that something that, that would yes. count? Yes, awesome. definitely. That's what I, I know do. that. <laughs> but it's a rough financial year for the district. So being able to utilize that money for that would be amazing. Good. Yes. Great. And I just edited um, the PD opportunities that are listed on our website. Um, we're kind of in some ways running out of <laughs> some PD opportunities. I'm, I'm trying to delete, you know, the ones that have passed. Um, but there's still a few. And again, they might not apply to everyone, but there are a few still available. So that link is in the chat. Um, I'm also, I, I don't want to self-promote you guys, but I, I'm doing some workshops on IPS or programs of study, you know, with um, Zello. I mean, you know, that kind of stuff, all of that would apply as well. So, okay. All right, just checking our chat. Good, well, I'm glad that some of you were able to tune in. So 
What are some things that you're doing with your IPS right now? What it what does your district do? Do you have go ahead and write in the chat or if anybody wants to unmute, but do you have advisory time? Who feels like it's going well, right? Who gets the point that IPS is so much more than a piece of paper? <laughs> and if you're thinking, what? IPS isn't a piece of paper? No, it's not. Um, so yeah, hi Mark, it's it's going well. We excited for you to join us. There you are. Hey, good. Hello. <laughs> Well, truth be told, I just had to shower because I just, I couldn't stand myself. And I know you can't smell me. I got that, but I could. So I, <laughs> I had to, I'm, I feel better now. Thank you. So how's it going? Is that the question we're asking? Well, I was actually zoning in on, you know, in Kansas, we work on something called the individual plan of study. And, you know, it's a lot of states do that, call it different things. Um, so I was just kind of that's a lot of the work I do. So I was just kind of poking around and seeing how it's going. And Kristen, you need to call me. <laughs> Let's get that going in your district. Because, you know, above all, even though it's so cool the, to do that with kids, it's a state requirement and your district's going to get in really big trouble if you're not doing it. So they've, they've been talking about that we're going to, our principal has, but then we're just kind of like waiting for that to happen. Um, mm -hmm. He's been talking about it all year and every meeting that we have, he brings it up. Oh, we're going to, we're going to talk about that soon. We're going to do something. Okay. Something. Seriously, throw my name out. I mean, that's, that's what I do is help districts um, with that. But Here's something I'm going to just shamelessly share some stuff, you guys. Uh, so on the Kansas Teaching Leading website, and I'll throw this in the chat. Um, so a lot of different things. The first round of this, those are the educator resources. So that second tab, like you can see. And then if you scroll to the top, or sorry, move to the top, the Kansans Can Initiatives. Um, I have some videos. Okay, buddy, come on. There we go. Um, if you guys scroll down, but then I have some things about, you know, the digital portfolios for IPS. What does that really mean? And as a mom of a kid that just graduated, what did that really mean for us? You know, because it's not just a list of things. We needed documents and she needed it in a Google file she could use. It's not going to do me any good to keep it in Zello. Um, I love Zello. I'm a Zello trainer, but it's, it, guys, it's a tool. It's, you know, think about Zello this way. I mean, we want to improve math skills. So we buy a really great math textbook, right? But we don't just hand it to kids and say, okay, good luck with that. We still have to teach, right? So if you're not teaching with Zello, you still aren't using it correctly. If you're just giving kids time on Zello or Navigator or no Onet or whatever, I don't care what you're using, that's not what it's designed to do. You need to teach with it. So here's a Zello overview. It's about 45 minutes long, so you might want to break it up a little bit because that's a lot of Lori to be talking, but that might help. Um, but then this last one, the advisory time really, you know, kind of some overall ideas that have worked with districts that I've worked with and even just kind of my thinking too, um, based on what I hear the state saying and other stuff. So maybe that might be helpful to get the ball rolling. And then um, I've developed a piece that IPS um, that is in addition to what we do with Zello. So if it's not enough, well, then what is? Well, here you go. So anyway, just give me a holler. Be happy to help. Or I'm sure your service center close to you would be happy to help too. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. Mark, hit it. Go ahead. Make well, good seat. afternoon, everyone. Again, thanks for carving out the time. Look at all these smiley faces. I know. Lori, were you, were you telling jokes or something before I came on today? We were having fun. We were talking. We were discussing. Right. Good. Good stuff. Hey, uh, perhaps one way we start uh, today is a little sentence starter. And then we'll just chime in and make this little story. Uh, <clears throat> one day, right in the middle of my lesson, all of a sudden, I'll do the sentence starter again. And the way this plays is just somebody gets to add something and then somebody adds and adds and adds and we'll, we'll see how fun the story gets. Oh, wow. 
like 60 seconds or so. Right. So here it is. Uh, uh, one day in the middle of my lesson, all of a sudden, student had to get up and go to the bathroom. Thank you. All right, keep going. We build the story from there. But on the way to the bathroom, their mom called them. And Johnny decided to go to the bathroom too. <laughs> good, this is good. Keep going, keep. Johnny couldn't return to class because he was helping a student that was emotionally disturbed. And when he did return to class, he shared, shared way too much information. This interrupted the entire class. Therefore, out of which? desperation, oh, we'll do this. Therefore, out of desperation, I. Threw the lesson plan out the window. And I decided to play heads up seven up with my students. All right, somebody bring it home. Bring the story home. At which point I noticed that Tommy was. Sleeping. <laughs> More interested in the fish in the fish tank than the game. <laughs> all right, all right, great. You can give yourselves a an applause for that. That was awesome. Thank you so very much. Are we recording this? All right, that is so worth the playback right there. Let me tell you. All right. Well, again, thanks for showing up. Thanks for carving out the time. Uh, I missed a little bit of the intro kind of conversations that you were having with Lori. So, is are all schools back? at school like are we at 100 percent? if you're at 100 percent back at school raise your hand go ahead thank you thank you and if you don't have your camera on yet and if you can that would be awesome so we can see your smiling faces but and how many people are doing a hybrid some sort of some on and some off anyone doing that okay some of you good anybody still completely 100 percent virtual Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, in California, our governor can't, well, I won't go there, but uh, it's it's a, just an interesting show here in California on how this whole thing's gonna go out, but uh, it's exciting. My teacher friends are so excited to get their students back in their classrooms. Kids are just like, can't wait. And of course, parents are just going, it has been so long. So they're really pushing to get kids back, obviously in a safe way, so that would be great. All right, well, today, oh, I love today's topic, I do. It's gonna take me just a moment. Let me see what I can do here with my, uh, with my slides. And let's see, we gonna do this little advanced thing right here. Maybe you've done this before. So if I kind of mess up or something, I'd appreciate uh, a little help with this. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, in the meantime, one thing that you're grateful for, you can type in the chat box if you'd like to do it that way, or if you'd like to unmute and just tell us, what is something you're grateful for? Supportive administration, spring breaks around the corner. Love that. Hmm. Well, isn't this interesting? Good, 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 good. All right. And I'm just kind of searching here. What else? Great students to work with. That's awesome. Who you you received your first dose of vaccine, Stacy? 
Awesome. Did it hurt? Texas ended the. Sorry. Yeah. Bye. It did not hurt. Oh well, that's good. That's that good. I've heard. Did you have any? Did you have any symptoms on the back side of it? Mm, the day after, maybe for three hours, but it wasn't like if that was, it was a Sunday. But if it was a work day, I would have worked. It wasn't bad at all. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, we're well, doing pretty good. well, Mark, in our state, for those that choose to get the vaccine, we're about 80%, almost 90% of those folks getting at least one dose. Wow. Yeah, we're about fifth in the nation right now. That is so awesome. And I know for some rural folks, they're like, what? We haven't had one. And that's very frustrating to hear Kansas is doing well when some of us yeah. are sitting there going, uh, not so well. So forgive me mm. for that. But yeah. Uh, in talking with soups across the state today, Dr. Watson was asking, and that's what we found out. So that's very encouraging. Yeah, nice. I see some two doses and stuff in the, the chat. So that's awesome. Good stuff. All right. Well, you can see I got a green screen, so I'm going to fix that. Hold on. Yeah. All right. Yeah, much better. Have you done this before in your Zoom? Raise your hand if you've, if you've done this where you can show your PowerPoint slides behind you. Like maybe you wouldn't have to do it now because you're probably not Zooming all the time, but, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll get yesterday's posters out of the way. And, all right, uh, today, I know that the, the title of today's session said enemies, plural of learning, and it listed a few of those. And I was thinking, um, for the sake of time, and also so that we not cover a bunch of material, but cover less material, but do it in a deeper way with more application, that we're just gonna choose one today. So I've called it the number one enemy of learning. Number one enemy of learning. Here's what's gonna to happen today. <clears throat> we're gonna, uh, by the time we're finished together, this is success criteria, yeah? discovered the number one enemy of learning and why it's so disruptive. Now, you and I can have a drink sometime, coffee, whatever, to have a conversation on whether or not you think today's enemy is the number one enemy of learning. We can talk about that sometime. If clearly not the, the number one, it's number two. Uncovered an essential law found in instructional design that defeats the enemy of learning. When you, when you catch this, some of you think like this already, but when you catch this today, this one little tool could make the difference between your level of frustration while you're teaching and having a joyful day. It could. And our other success criteria is you feel inspired and challenged and, and motivated as well. As we continue, we always do, do agreements. And I do this as a way of modeling for you that with every class period, highly suggest, and this, this pulls from, brings forward from what, what Lori was sharing last time about classroom management, is that yes, we have rules and yes, we have policies and yes, we have procedures. Suggestion is you might have agreements as well. And those agreements are always revisited every class period. Now I know it sounds like it might be tedious or whatever, but when they feel like agreements and guidelines, it's a simple reminder of how we're gonna interact with one another, me, the teacher, and the, me and the students, the students and I, students and me, and, and the students with each other. And what it does is it sets up uh, a really solid foundation with clear expectations for, so that students know exactly what's expected of them all the time. And I know as much as we would love for students to remember what our agreements are, like how to be in my classroom, we want them to remember day after day after day. The truth is they've had five or six teachers before you or since you, and life has been just different than it might be in your, in your class. So look, that's why I'd set, take a few moments and set this up. All right, three agreements. First one, tune in. Curiosity is a wonderful thing. Support positively. So as people are sharing ideas in the chat box, when you go into breakout rooms and you're sharing, 
simply simple as saying thank you or hey that's a great idea or thanks so much for sharing that or wow i got a lot out of that conversation support positively and crave clarity especially in today's session uh, it's going to get I'll let you know it's going to get very practical but before we get to practical it's going to get cerebral for just a moment and i know you've been teaching all day just keep breathing i'll move right part past that that part or through that part uh, with as much uh, clarity as i possibly can so those are the three tune in there's lots of things that can distract you some of you are still at school you are at your desk i'm sure there's papers around maybe you have your cell phone maybe you're going to get interrupted by students do whatever you need to do so you can take this time for the next half hour, 45 minutes of, of using this time for you, the law of infusion, taking care of you. Support positively and crave feedback. If you are willing to the very best of your ability to live by these three agreements today, would you simply type yes into the chat box? And if typing is not something you wanna do, I'll take a smile or a thumbs up because that would work as well. Excellent. Beautiful. Uh, <clears throat> one more word about agreements. They're simple. They speak to how we're going to interact. So they're guidelines. They're not rules. You're not going to get punished if you don't tune in. If you turn off your camera and walk away, like, I don't know, right? There's no punishment. There's no immediate consequence, if you will. Support positively just to whatever degree you can, craving clarity, that's totally up to you. But what it does is it sets forth some social norms that have to do with who I am as a person and how I'm showing up. So I'm gonna stay tuned in, supporting you positively and craving any clarity because you could be asking questions in the chat box or interrupt with your hand raised. And I'm gonna do my very best to crave clarity for you uh, and understanding what your question is as well. Uh, with that, so imagine, imagine that this happened to you. Maybe it happened today. Maybe it happened, oh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Maybe you're hoping that this is going to happen to you. But this is you on a really great day, and you are absolutely in the flow. Thoughts are coming to you, your salient points are coming to you. You've got the example, you've got the analogy, you've got the metaphor, you've got it all. It's all going on. All the technology is working the way you want to. Students are there, that's a good thing. And they're not just not hanging out, but they're actually like pen in hand, paper. They've got everything they need. They're looking at you bright-eyed, leaning forward, eyebrows raised, almost at the edge of their seat, hanging on your every word. Think of a time that that's happened, maybe today. Good, has this ever happened for you or could you imagine that this could happen for you? Good, good, do a little wave like this, please. Great, thanks. And then all of a sudden, all you did was turned around. You, they were absolutely, absolutely with you. You could have stopped and they still would not have moved. But you, you turned and you needed to write something on the board or whatever. So you had to write something down, something, you turned your attention away. And when you got back and looked at the students, what happened? These attentive individuals are now sitting there, some slouched back, some of them with their hand in their, their head in their hand, some of them going, oh, and they're shaking their head like this. Others are just got their head down and doodling on their notes. Something happened from the moment you left that last point you made to here and then back here. 
And I know we could say an airplane flew over, something hit the window, somebody came in the door, some kid had a freak out accident or something. You could go there, but we're not gonna go there. Your students went from this to this. And the question is, what could have ruined such a beautiful teaching moment? And we're gonna keep this in the confines, in the circle, if you will, of teaching and learning content, their ability to access the content, assimilate the content, retain the content, understand the content. We're gonna keep it there. Yes, there could have been lots of distractions from all around that could ruin this beautiful teaching moment. But now we're gonna think of it in terms of, wow, what was there something that the teacher did or said, didn't do or say, or what's happening in the students? As you're coming up with that answer, Lori, I forgot to give you a little heads up. Can you get us into breakout rooms in the next couple of moments? Okay, you know, four or five people, something like that. And while she's doing that uh, and helping us to move into breakout rooms, this is gonna, this is a get in and get out kind of conversation today. So what you'll want, what you'll want to come up with in your conversation is a list of three or four somethings that ruined this beautiful teaching moment. So this is going to be four people, probably four minutes worth. Make sure you introduce yourselves as well. That would be great. All right. All right. Lori's ready. Oh, wow. You're fast. Hey. Oh, these are awesome answers. We talked about how a void was created. What kind of void? So like yeah. that, either um, a void of like, you had a great thought and then that got paused because you were writing on the board or um, you had a void maybe um, of like their knowledge. So like you, you're talking above them for a second. So like they were with you and then like they got lost because there was like a separation there. Okay. Great. Kind of a hybrid of, of one of the things that we were talking about is Sometimes you build out your lesson plan and you break something, BCTE, right? Tools break, product breaks or whatever. So that caused you to get off kilter and them off kilter. Yeah. And sometimes we even said it might not be a bad thing to break things on purpose sometimes. And then have them help problem solve what went wrong. But you gotta be okay. sharp on your feet. Clever, yes, yes. <laughs> nice. Those are awesome. And all of those things indeed can can and did and would contribute to smashing that beautiful teaching moment. We're gonna we're gonna uncover, like take a couple of layers off of how we're approaching this situation and get down to a fundamental uh, it's really an instructional design issue. Now, I know I didn't paint the scenario very well in order to highlight that. Uh, <clears throat> and what oftentimes happens, well, you know what? I'm getting, I'm getting way ahead of myself because this is just too cool. I'm gonna share my screen again. I think I can do this. Yes, here we go. <laughs> there we go. And here we go. That's a new trick I just found out that when you leave, that's gonna start you from the very beginning. All right, so what happened? One of the things that could have happened in a scenario like that, or even in a scenario where they're just following along with you, they're not necessarily enraptured, hanging on your every word, but they're following along, you know it, you can feel the connection, they're looking up appropriate times, they're looking down, taking notes, whatever, they're engaging in your questions or 
quick little paired shares or anything like that. <clears throat> and then as you're moving, it just is going along so well. And then it just doesn't. It just, and you can see it, right? Could you show, would you please show us what it looks like? Not your students, because your students would stay, you know, captured with you all the time, I'm sure. In somebody else's classroom, if you were to see students who all of a sudden just zoned out, just got disconnected of the whole thing, what would that look like? Could you just show that to us, please? Show the person in the square next to you what that looks like when students kind of zone out like that. Oh, some of you aren't mo moving, which means I'm wondering if you're zoned out right now. Good. All right. Thank you. Good. Now show the person next to you what it looks like to be absolutely tuned in and attentive. Show that person what that looks like. Beautiful. Thanks. What can happen, and this is introduction to the number one the number one enemy of learning, confusion. Think about times, perhaps in a master's classes that you were taking and things were trucking along just fine. And all of a sudden, it could have been something that went on the board. It could have been something that the professor said to you. It could have been something you were reading. I, I don't know, but all of a sudden, clarity went to confusion. And that cl when clarity, or excuse me, when confusion happens, what happens in the brain is a, co is a, a condition called cognitive overload. Thumbs up if you've heard cognitive overload before. Good, good. Will you look at the person below you and the square below you? Look at that person square below you and say the words cognitive overload. Go ahead, just say it to him. Cognitive, cognitive overload. Very nice, great, thank you. <clears throat> now we know overload to happen in lots of areas of our lives. Here's a circuit board, right? Got overload with too much amperage or again, I'm outside of my league when it comes to this type of stuff, but clearly something happened that wasn't supposed to happen and we have a a condition called overload. There's an overload that happens in our vehicles. Too much weight, for example, might snap springs or rods. An overload of pressure in a tire could be too much air, could be that it got hit by something. Lots of different ways that we overload. Computer motherboards. My, my son builds computers for his friends. He just finished one for his brother. And um, he had a motherboard fry the other day, just put the wrong wire in the wrong place and things just kind of melted on him. And then there's also another kind of overload that we experience in our life. And that for me happens at Thanksgiving. I get this overloaded kind of feeling. And when that happens, my brain goes numb, my body gets tired. So in our life, in real life, we experience overload. Overload also happens cognitively. We call it cognitive overload, which suggests to us that although the brain, as far as we know, has nearly infinite uh, potential with the billions of neural connections that occur just within this three pound mass we call our brain, we know that in, under certain conditions, even as well-tuned as our brains are, it can hit this place of gone, I stop, I, nothing more. You've probably experienced that. Perhaps your students have experienced that as well. So we'll introduce you to the law of content and process. Law of content and process. I'm curious to know, and Lori, I can only see about five or six people across my screen. Uh, I'm curious how many people are familiar with this law of content and process? So maybe you can look around as well. I'm going to flip through some screens. And if you are, that could be like a great big smile. Content and process. Uh, you, you'll probably understand what content is and what process is. Are you familiar with the law of content and process? Big smiles anywhere? Good. 
Big smiles if you are familiar or have heard the term cognitive overload. There's some smiles. Good, I think nod heads. I'll take nod heads, that'll work too. All right, this is the law of content and process. And it is the antidote. It's the antidote to confusion. Now there's a couple of other antidotes as well. Uh, meaning making would be one, pattern seeking would be another, uh, application relevance would be other ones. But today we're gonna focus on this antidote called the law of content and process. And just like we have laws in the physical world, like we have examples of overload in the physical world, we have example of cognitive overload in our brain, just like in the physical world, gravity, the law of content and process is, works just like gravity. It works with every student, anywhere, anytime. It works with you and I all the time. Sometimes it happens in our emotional or our relationships. We get into a cognitive overload when we just get home and maybe a spouse or loved one or somebody rushes up and then starts going, this is what happened in my day. And for the next seven minutes, just spills everything that was going on. And all of a sudden it's like, ah, I'm, this is just too much. It is a law. Just like with any other physical law, like gravity, when we live by the law, there are rewards. When we break the law, there are consequences. So we look at this law of content and process today, keep asking ourselves, hmm, how am I playing by the law of content and process when I'm teaching, interacting with my students? And when are those moments when mm, maybe I forgot about it, even though it was still at work? <clears throat> what, as you know, when we get, rid of we get rid of confusion, that means we have clarity. So what happened in that moment when students were tracking and all of a sudden they're not tracking, they were clear up to that point. And then there was a moment when they were unclear. <clears throat> to understand the law of content and process, I'm gonna get into a little neuroscience just for a moment. Some people really like that. In fact, as soon as I said neuroscience, some of you like sat up in your chair. Other people are like, okay, just get through it, Mark. I'll stay with you, but just promise it's not more than 30 seconds. All right, here it is. There are precepts, neurological, neuroscience-based precepts that drive the law of content and process. Here's the one. Learning is work for the brain. From a scientific standpoint, the movement of energy, the interacting of parts, the consumption of certain things and, and creation of others, that's known as work. In neuroscience, learning, the very, the very physiological action of creating neural pathways is work in the brain. The work of content, understanding content, and the work of understanding a process in the brain are two distinctly different types of work or energy. The way I have to think about acquiring and assimilating content is different than learning how to move through a sequence. And third, Competition arises when the brain attends to new content and a new process simultaneously. So learning is work, producing of energy. It is two different processes, content, or excuse me, two different kind of energies or work going on in the brain, content and process. And when both of those are occurring at the same time, they compete. And when they compete is when we get that sense of cognitive overload. <clears throat> Here's the learning general's warning about the law of content and process. And I'm gonna pause for a moment. This, 
I use, I, there's only a couple of workshops that I do where I actually use the learning journals warning. But what I find is that it's something so unique because most people read those on labels like in cigarettes or on certain soda, right? Or uh, the sign that's at the pump station about carcinogens or whatever. So it's just an interesting little way to get people's attention. Uh, here we go. Here's what the learning general has to say. Violation, well, you can read it. <clears throat> Here is the definition of the law of content and process. If you're note taking, please write this down. We, we will come back to this. So it'd be nice to have it right there in front of you when you need it. The law of content and process says, we teach new content or a new process, but never at the same time. We teach new content or we teach a new process, never at the same time. Good, we're gonna say that out loud together. I'm gonna say it one more time and then you can say it. You can mouth the words if you'd like. I teach new content or new process, but never at the same time. All right, let's say it together teach new content or new process, but never at the same time. What do we mean by a, a content? Here's just some ideas, right? It's any knowledge, any model, any theory, any concept, any formula, any terms, any systems, any procedures, anything that you deliver as a topic, right? That's easy to understand, content. So notice the distinction between content and a process, because although we understand often what is the difference between those two, we mix them up. And the law of content and process says you must know the distinctions between what is content and what is process. And here's what process is. It's any method used to either acquire the content or apply it. You could say assimilate it as well, apply it. <clears throat> I wanna pause right here. What questions do we have about what we've said so far? <clears throat> Lori, I've noticed that somebody has something in the chat box. I'm concerned that if I hit the chat box while I'm in this Excuse viewing mode. I'm just, oh. I just made a note of what you said. So. Okay, great, well, thank you. Thanks, thank you for doing that, awesome. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, say thank you, Lori. There we go, see all those smiles? Awesome. All right, and no questions right now, we're gonna keep moving. Here we go. Here are examples. In math and science, for example, content are the symbols, like the square root symbols and the plus signs and the equal signs and integers and all of that type of, Thing. In geometry, it's the angles and the, it's the diameter circles, all that, right? That's the symbols, that's content. What we do with that content in math and science, we call it an equation. Now you might be thinking, wait, wait, the equation for um, slope intercept or the quadratic equation, maybe it's the same thing, I don't know, that maybe you're saying, well, that is the content, yes, Yes, that thing itself is the content. But when I'm working through that formula, that, e that equation, because the process in which I am taking the content of the particular parts of the equation and putting it into play. English, world language, in fact, you can say this about math and science and social science and history and any subject that you're teaching right now, any vocabulary the name of the tool, uh, photosynthesis, respiration, um, bead, um, 
ruminant, or rather, cow stomach stuff, <laughs> right? Like all that, right? All of that is just vocabulary. And you know how important vocabulary is because if students do not have a clear, meaningful, relevant understanding of the vocabulary, they will not master your content. So here's a little side note, a little uh, thing for you to remember. Anytime you are teaching students information, even if it's review, never assume that they understand the meaning of the most important vocabulary. I was coaching a social science teacher <clears throat> one semester and uh, he was teaching about freedom, democracy, uh, <clears throat> freedom, democracy, representation, some of those kind of really common words, yes? When it comes to teaching <laughs> about history and government. And lesson after lesson, when he would ask questions, he was noticing that students weren't answering using the vocabulary. And so their answers were a little half answers, right? Kind of there, kind of not. And so in the conversation we had one day, I simply asked him, I said, uh, what, what would you make, let's just make a list, little list of what are three or four of the most important vocabulary words that you, you want your students to know? In fact, you probably even believe that they know them already. And he said, you mean what, like government? I said, yeah, great, that's a great start. Let's go with government. So government. And then we got into freedom and democracy and representation and all of that. And then I asked him, how, mm, how do you know that every single one of your students has a clear definition of the word freedom? And he said, I, I, never, I never thought about it. He said, they've heard that, you know, they've grown up with the word freedom. Exactly, exactly. And sure enough, what we found out is when he did more direct instruction around this is what this word means, with multiple examples or having students do it, all of a sudden their comprehension right raised, leveled up, and then he could ask those higher order questions. Nod your head if this makes sense. Okay, a little side note. All right, so when we take the vocabulary and we put it into sentences, write an essay, for example, then that's process. All right, I don't wanna overkill this. I just wanna make sure that we're crystal clear about content and process before we take it to another, to another look at it. In the shop, laboratory, names of tools and uses, for example. Welding, cutting, planting, what we do with that tool and the ways in which we use that tool, that is the, all right, everybody got this, yes? I'm gonna go one more just to bring it home. Social science and history. When we do scenarios and case studies, in fact, you might do scenarios and case studies now as you might teaching students about budgets or like planning for the, uh, for the banquet or something and project management. So you're gonna throw out some case studies or even just scenarios. Well, what would happen everybody if this happens during the banquet, those type of things, the case scenario and all the parts that make up the people, the place, the plot, whatever, that's the content the kind of questions that we ask them to use to analyze, that is the process. All right, here we go. Law of content and process. The law of content and process says you either teach new content or we teach new process, but how's the rest of it go, everybody? Say it out loud. Exactly. All right. So what does it look like when we're playing by the law? Here's what that looks like. Some people like the visual. Symbols, vocabulary, names of tools, uses, scenarios, case studies, uh, content. If that content is new, the law says that we've got to be lighter on the process. Right. Or we choose to teach the new process etc., like these items. So the question is, what happens when we teach new content, brand new content to students, 
while we teach them a new process. What happens to the teeter-totter, do you think? Show me with your hands. So if this would be level, but one was like content, right? New content, light process. And then it was like, that. what would happen to the teeter-totter if new was on both sides? Show me with your hands, please. What would happen to it? Exactly, exactly. It would break. Okay. Thank you, Mark, for the physics lesson, the geometry. Thanks for the over explanation of all the examples. I take the time to do that so that we are crystal clear about how this law works. Now we can take a look at some specific examples. Well, yeah, it creates clarity. All right, here we go. So I'll pause there for a moment just as we look at the clarity slide. So here's an example. You are teaching, uh, you're teaching some new content, but you want the students to take notes in a new way. Maybe they're using a flip book. Maybe they're using a, a cluster way of taking notes rather than a more linear way of taking notes. So you just taught them the process of taking notes. And now we're gonna teach some brand new content while they are learning how to do the new process called note-taking. That is one of those simple examples of what happens when there is new content. I have to understand the concepts that you're teaching me and I'm having to learn how to take that information in and assimilate it. New content, new process breaks the board. Make sense? All right, well, let's find out because now we're going to now we're going to drive it home. There are three questions that you can ask yourselves, instructional designers, lesson planners. These are three questions they ask themselves when it comes to the law of content and process. Is the segment of this lesson new content or new process? It's a deliberate conscious answer to that question. If what we want is students to stay engaged, cognitively stay engaged for as long as possible, and we're doing all the right things like taking a, a little mind break every once in a while or switching it up, I'm lecture, 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 lecture right now for eight minutes. So now I'm gonna have them turn and talk to their partner and read something from their notes. Maybe I'm gonna have them stand up for a moment. And then while they're standing, grab their notebook and they're gonna start taking notes while they're standing. You're doing all those things. You're doing callbacks. You're saying an important word and they're repeating the word back to you. You have hand motions to go with certain processes. So they're doing those with you. You're doing all of those things. Even asking the appropriate question at the appropriate time during the learning process. Let's say that all of that is working and yet there are those moments where they're right and then they have gone. And you're standing there wondering, I don't know what happened. And when we ask students to say, you know, what happened? The most common response is you lost me. Mm -hmm. You lost me. Here's the second question. If it's new content, we ask ourselves, what familiar process can I use when I'm sharing or teaching this new content? I watched a welding teacher <clears throat> uh, before they ever went out to the shop. And I, I suppose you all do this as well, but I thought it was kind of novel where every kid had tooth, so toothpaste and they were drawing a bead with toothpaste. Just smile at me like, really Mark, you figured this just, you just really kind of figured this out all of a sudden. Yeah, right. And they, so that's a familiar, familiar process. I know how to squeeze a, a toothpaste too. Familiar process. But I'm learning if I turn it, tilt it this way, it does that. Or if I push this, this hard, it does that. So that's the new content, the new distinctions, but I'm using a familiar process. If it's a new process, what familiar content can I use? All right, I'm gonna go back to note taking for just a moment because I think it's simple for all of us to understand, easy to grasp. With note taking, 
if we're teaching students that uh, Cornell notes, right, two column note taking system, right, where they're going to uh, write some annotation or questions or something off to the side as they take the notes in linear fashion usually. So let's say that we're teaching them how to do that. We're going to teach content that they already know. In fact, the more ridiculously simple the content, the better they'll learn the process. For example, and this is an extreme example, if you were teaching Cornell note style, you could tell them a nursery story, Little Red Robin Hood, as the content, because the content's a no brainer. So they're not going to struggle with understanding the vocabulary, understand, like they've got schema to pull from existing knowledge, but we're working on just what that process is. That's what I love about the toothpaste thing with welding, for example. Right. Now, these are what the three questions look like. So let's look at it as a diagram. You're going to get all these the slides and things as well. In lesson design, we always start with the outcome. What do I want my students to know and be able to do? Every lesson always starts like that. The clearer you are about exactly what the success criteria are, and that's communicated to students, the better that they're going to do during the lesson. <clears throat> so then we have a decision. If you know flowchart symbols, you know that the diamond is a decision uh, object and shape. So we ask ourselves, is this a new content or new process I'll be teaching today? If it's a new content, the way this little flowchart works is that, oh, I'm going to use a familiar process to get to that outcome. You could imagine what the bottom of the flowchart looks like. If it's a new process, then I got to figure out some familiar content so we can get to that outcome. So here's the question for you. Think of something you taught today or maybe yesterday, something you taught today. Was it new content you were teaching or was it a new process? for you to think. <clears throat> Some of you might be wondering, oh, oh, I don't know, maybe you had the little revelation that you taught both at the same time. Let's take the process of photosynthesis for a moment. The process of photosynthesis has certain elements in it. I'll call them elements. There's probably a better scientific word for that in the photosynthesis process. <clears throat> so when that's an equation, that photosynthesis equation. So oftentimes what we do is we teaching, we're teaching the equation while we're teaching the component parts that make up that equation. So students are trying to understand what chlorophyll is. I, Somebody help me with the photosynthesis. I got myself here in a situation where I may be talking uh, an example, just photosynthesis. It's something plus something, something. Can someone share, please? It's been too long. I don't remember. Oh, okay. I was <laughs> thinking that maybe was somebody was teaching biology in their agriculture classes. Or Water, CO2. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay, sunlight water, CO2, right? So those three things now become the content. And I'm just curious, again, I'm just, I'm just working this through as a mental kind of uh, problem solving activity, which is, huh, how often when we teach something like photosynthesis, that we just go ahead and show the equation with all the component parts all put together and then as we're explaining about each one of the parts, they're still trying to figure out the plus and equal to the whole thing. Now, I know it seems like, wow, it shouldn't be that big a deal. Remember, in the brain, content processes are two different energy levels. And when I'm paying attention to one, I have less energy to do the work of the other. And so when I, ask, so when I often 
think about kids and, and their learning and how do we really help kids to learn well the first time? I'm gonna say that again. How do we help our students learn well during first instruction? Because by the way, you cannot intervene a student out of poor first instruction. Again, this is something you and I can have a beer on sometime if you want, I, I don't know, but I'm just saying that that is absolutely, absolutely the truth because of how the neuro neurological pathways work in the brain. And what happened, Dr. Madeline Hunter used to tell us all, just about every time we ever saw her, she said, um, learning is like wet cement. It dries quickly and it's a bugger to break up. Now, the good news is our brains are incredibly, have plasticity, right? And it can wire and rewire itself. Great, that's the good news. That's great news. But when you think about struggling learners, and if they, if they don't get it as best they can during first instruction, and they're 15 years old, and they've not been a successful student up until your class, then they're bringing all of that perception of themselves self-confidence, self-efficacy, whatever. They're bringing all that to that moment. And when those moments of confusion happen, because the teacher didn't think through it just one more step, they go, see, see, science, there it is, science, jeez. Here we go again, one more time. And then we go, oh, look, they didn't get it, so they need intervention. Yeah, they need intervention. My plea to you is, that in first instruction, how great can it get? My plea is to say, think it through. And yes, there are some students that have learning gaps and some students who have learning challenges and yes, yes. And for the majority of students in that bottom rung of the MTSS, right? The RTI pyramid thing at that bottom, first instruction on the pyramid, that puppy ought to be really big, that level. All right, I'm gonna stop there about the whole first instruction thing. <clears throat> and when we're doing first instruction, designing our lessons according to the law of content and process ensures that that first time instruction it's gonna be of a higher quality than had we not lived by the law. Great. All right, quick little knowledge check. Three, more, three, three or four more minutes, I think, Lori. And uh, here we go. A quick knowledge check. Please type into the, the chat box. Oh, oh yes, here we go. You know, look at the, watch the directions. Listen very, very carefully. Okay, everybody hands off the keyboards. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Good, good. Thank you very much. Hand off the keyboard. In just a moment, I'm going to say type. And when you when type into the chat box, you will type the definition of the law of content and process. Remember, it says teach new content or teach new process. Never at the both same time. Okay, that's what you're going to type. All right. Let's say type. And when you finish typing, hands off the keyboard and please wait for me to say send. See how that goes? All right, that way everybody's thinking on your own and then we can compare later, answers later. All right, here we go. Type in the chat box the definition of the law of content and process. Man, some people must be typing like 152 words a minute or something. That's fast. Good, good. Another couple of moments. Lori, I'm only seeing four or five people. So as you look across the screen, how are we doing? I think you better say send because we're all sending. <laughs> oh, great. All right. And send. Isn't that kind of how that happens in class too, right? 
You, doesn't matter how clear your instructions are, how emphatic and, and, and expressive you are about the importance of following the instructions exactly the way you want them to be followed. Silly humans. All right. All right, let's go back to our uh, success criteria. We'll wrap this up. <clears throat> one finger up if you discovered the number one enemy of learning and why it's so disruptive. Put a finger up if that's true for you. Good. And the number one enemy of learning is, starts with a C. Everybody say it out loud. Confusion. And confusion. Very nice. Good. You uncovered an essential law, and you know the name of that law to be the law of, say it out loud, everybody. Content and, Content and process. Process. Good. And this last one, it's totally up to you. Did you feel inspired? Like, oh, this, this could solve a problem. <laughs> Did you feel challenged? Like, huh, I never really thought about that before. Did you feel motivated? to like, oh, I so get it. I'm gonna go do something about it. So if you did, just go ahead and give me a little twinkle like this. So I know where you are with that, any of those. Excellent, thank you. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna include with this, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. And, oops, how do I stop sharing? Oh yeah, it says stop share. All right, good. Curious to know, just in the next couple of moments, what, made the most sense to you or what was salient that you definitely want to remember out of today's session? And this is where you can go ahead and unmute and you can speak with us. Uh, I, I like the tie that you made between vocabulary and confusion. Uh, a lot of times I think that I, I take for granted the, the vocabulary that my students know. And when we're talking about new content in particular, and I'm, I'm, I'm using words, um, sometimes I need to pump the brakes and make sure I'm, I'm thoroughly explaining because they're, you know, very rarely will they, they stop me and, and ask specifically, you know, okay, well, what does that, what are you, what is it that you're telling me? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think that that was, that was very important. Good, good. Thank you, Greg. Mark, it was like you were in my classroom and you knew those students when you were describing them, I could pick out those students that, that, I mean, it was just, it was that aha moment of that's what it's happening. And I, I mean, it, it was just, wow. It was an aha moment. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, and for all of you in your years three through five, think about your first year of teaching and perhaps you didn't have that sense yet. And now you're starting to get that, you know, wait a second. So it, it comes with time and for some, it never comes ever, but, <laughs> but <laughs> give yourself some peace that, you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It, there's a lot going on in your brain that doesn't allow you to be open to how kids are feeling. Who else is going to share? This will actually help me at basketball practice. Really, Kendra? Not, How? Want to hear that? Yeah. Well, because like that lady said, um, I'm think I do eighth grade basketball now, and you the whole I have like a vocabulary sheet that I have them mark at the beginning, and um, where I live, basketball is not the main sport, and so they don't get a lot of that, but. When you're trying to do something new in basketball and you're trying to do new content, new process, that whole teeter-totter thing is totally true. Yeah. So now I have to go and rearrange my basketball practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. You know, Kendra, Kendra you, well, go. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, please feel free if you need to. But, yeah. um, you know, as a musician, I played a little bit of, well, I won't even tell you about my sports career. It, it began and ended in sixth grade in a three week period. So, so let me go into the music for just a moment, but, and Kendra and other people who teach sports, you know that there's a difference between practicing and rehearsing. You know, there's, there's a difference between running drills and doing a scrimmage. Yeah, very that. much so, yeah. Right, exactly. So as a musician, it's exactly the same thing. I have to know the notes and the rhythm 
I have to know how to play each one of those notes exactly in that rhythm. And then I can take that measure or two of music and then I can put it, rehearse it, I can put it in a scrimmage, it's what they call it in sports, into the larger flow of the piece of music. Because then yeah. now it makes sense, right? So it's exactly yep. the same thing in sports. And what we forget, I love what Jim said in our group that he's a coach and he loves to see how much of his coaching he can bring into his teaching. And this is one of those things. You know, what are those, the little content that we take so much for granted that we think, we assume that students know already. And maybe that's just the one thing that we got to make sure that we just, we drill it, right? Skill development on just that before we start giving them the bigger processes to work with. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Lori, I think um, we are bumping up against time. So I, I'm going to say once again, thank you so much for carving out the time. And as always, my intention is, is that we are better today than we were yesterday. And that based on what it is that we talked about, explored, learned today, that we're better tomorrow than we were today. So have at it. Proud of all of you for still going to work every day through all the craziness. <laughs> you bet. Well, thanks, Mark. We certainly appreciate it. And we're always glad to have you join us. And everybody have a great rest of your evening and a super weekend and a restful spring break. So we will see you in April and just holler at us if there's anything that you need or anything that we can help you with. So everybody have a great evening. See you later. Bye. Bye everybody. Hey Mark. Yeah, Jim. I had a question for you. Sure. Uh, oh, I'm gonna... So the, the effort and um, 